Man, we're going to have to have a special class on how to chair sets. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I always want to do that to people because they all sit different ways. And I got this, I don't have OCD, but there are certain things that I'm OCD about. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, just can't take it. Anyway, side point. All right, open your Bibles with me to uh, Mark chapter 5. I'll be there in a second. If you uh, had one of these given to you, many, most of you know what this is about. You just don't use it. By the way, do you know why, why we pass out outlines? Okay, you guys are paying no attention today. All right, Staunton, do you know why we have outlines? So we pay attention? No, so you'll remember. See, if you, if you hear something, you remember a certain percentage of it. If you hear it and write it down, you remember more of it, right? If you hear it and you write it down and then you see it on the screen, you remember even more of it. Are you ready? If you hear it and then you write it down and then you see it on the screen and then you go do it, you remember it. You see how that works? So sometimes when you forget things, it's because you didn't write it down or you wrote it down and didn't see it or you wrote it down and saw it, but you didn't remember to do it. So I want to encourage you to do the things God's put in your heart. This is just a part of the process. This is not a piece of paper we're just trying to waste money on or just try to get you to waste some time on. We're trying to help you in your spiritual development process. So the point of these little pieces of paper, one is communication. Let us know what's going on. If there's something we need, you know, address changes, all kind of stuff, that's one part. Another part is you can send us messages like, hey, I, I received Christ my Savior today. Or I'm ready to be baptized. Or where those, th- those check boxes are. I'm ready to volunteer in an area of ministry. Or it's like, hey, I just made a decision to stop this or start this or... I follow through with this or here's something God's put in my heart to do or pray about or whatever it is. The point is when you write that down, it sticks in you a little more. When you raise it in your hand and someone comes and gets that, it has more accountability to it because you're not the only one. Because you know how that is sometimes when you make a decision in your brain, I'm gonna start something or stop something, but nobody knows. It's easy not to do that. So the idea is now it's a little easier to follow through. So use these, you write that stuff down, raise your hand, we'll bring you another one, or you can just put in the offering plate at the end of the service, that'd be great too. All right, uh, Mark, chapter, Mark chapter five, we was there last week, I'm gonna pick up with the rest of the story as it kinda goes on, I'm gonna pick up there, and what we're talking about today is interrupted need, interrupted need. Um, so let me kinda remember from last week a little bit. Uh, so, Last week, Jesus had gotten out of a boat. He was attacked, you know, in, by a demonic possessed guy who was coming after him. He spoke to him, okay? He cast that demon out. The demon, the, the, the person, well, the person before that, the, per- the person who was demonized comes and falls at his feet and says, what do you want to do? And the demons, you know, talk to Jesus. Jesus says, who are you? And he says, my name is Legion because we're many. And he cast them out into a bunch of pigs and, and the pigs go drown themselves and the guy was made normal again. He was in his right mind, it says. And that's how that ended. And the, and the point is, that was not what Jesus went there to do. Jesus was interrupted by that situation. Okay? And, and sometimes we don't think about this, but I mean, we know it's true, we don't see that as a spiritual thing, but interruptions are just part of life, right? That just happen all the time, and I'll, I'll kind of get that in a minute. So now, that has just happened. Um, uh, Jesus told the guy, go tell a story. Verse 21, Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed by, uh, over by a boat to the other side, so he went back where he came from, okay, Capernaum, a large crowd gathered around him uh, while he was by the lake. When he, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. So this guy, so he's a Jewish leader. He would probably been a lay leader or a, a volunteer. He probably wasn't a paid person at the Jewish synagogue. Okay, so he, that's where he worked at. That's what he did is his volunteer job. Like many of you guys you know, volunteer lots of hours here. That's what he did. Um, he comes and he falls, and this is not just a private situation, it's in front of all these people. He falls at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. That phrase healed and live in the Greek has a lot more depth than it does in our sentence. It's not just so you can be healed. It's like, so you can be healed and not just live as in have a, have a you know, breathing life, but you can live, uh, that you can be healed and actually have life. Like almost like capital L life, you know what I mean? Like that you can live and have a purpose. You can live and, and do something that matters. So that phraseology that she can be healed, is not just that she can be healed. That she can be healed and carry out the thing that God has assigned her to do. It's kind of a, a way to translate that. Um, so Jesus went with him, verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. 
A woman was there who had been a subject of bleeding for 12 years. So she'd had some kind of woman issue and, you know, whether it was some kind of period related or whatever it may have been, there was something wrong with her and for 12 years she'd had some kind of bleeding, which I can't imagine that being, a, anyway. <laughs> she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, when that phrase is, like any kind of, and if I knew how to, all these things, if you understood what these words were, I would, I would give you a list of them. But basically, they had um, rules about what happened to a person. The, the, the phrase they used was an issue of blood. You have an issue of blood. If you're a woman, there's a certain thing you do. And, and some of them were things like grind this you know, grain up and then grind this grain up and then mix them together and then pour some wine into that and stir that all up and then drink that. And they would say, and if that doesn't work, then they'd go to the next thing, right? So there's all these different concoctions you'd come up with, right? These potions they'd make up. Some of them were really funny, like have them drink such and such, and then while they're doing that, jump, come from behind them and scare them while saying it had a phrase to say, okay? The, the phrase to say was, um, arise, O flax. Like, okay, okay, what we do, we sneak up behind someone and go, boo, right? Can you imagine sneaking behind, arise, O flax! Anyway. That was a part of the, of the stuff. And then one of them was, okay, now picture this. A woman's been bleeding for um, 12 years. So, you, you know, low on iron, low energy, all kind of stuff, I'm assuming, right? And then one of them was, go dig seven ditches. <laughs> right? And while she's digging the seven ditches, you run behind her and scare her and say, arise, old fly. It's like, what the heck, right? Anyway, so for 12 years, she'd had a problem. For 12 years, she'd gone through all the different things the doctors had told her to do. A little Bible humor. Mark, is, he's kind of short and to the point. So he says things like, um, um, suffered many things. She had suffered many things by the doctors, right? If you read this story in the book of Luke, Luke, by the way, if you don't know this, Luke, by his, his, his actual profession was he was a doctor, right? What Luke says is, and no one could heal her. It's like, he was covering, you know what I'm saying? Like, anyway. The point, is, the point is, she couldn't get over her things she had for 12 years, right? She'd done all the different little things they had, and some of them were, you know, sometimes the, have you ever read, like, the medicine that the doctor gives you to make you better? Have you ever read it and thought, oh my gosh, I'd, have a, I'd rather have what I have than what that may give me? Like, you know, the, the fine print, it, it could cause this and this and this and this and this. You're going, oh my gosh, you're kidding me, right? Well, the things that they did to her, were worse than the things she had. It's what that's basically what, when it says that she had suffered many things, that's what I was trying to say. Verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now, the way that's written in the Greek, it's called the imperfect tense. There's different, like we have past, present, future. They have different tenses. They have like eight different tenses or whatever it is. And so one of those tenses is imperfect. What it actually indicates is she was walking up behind Jesus and the whole time in her head she kept saying, if I just touch him in his garment, I'll be healed. If I just touch him in his garment, I'll be healed. That's what she's doing. She's, she's talking herself into it. For whatever reason, she's terrified. Maybe she's not terrified of him as much as this is my last resort. If this doesn't fix me, I don't know what my problem's gonna be. Right? I don't know what she was thinking. Maybe she was thinking, if this doesn't work, I'll kill myself. I don't know what she was thinking, but the way that is written in the Greek tense, she wasn't just saying it to herself one time. If I touch him, I will be healed. It's that she walked up behind him, she kept repeating to herself over and over and over. I mean, can you imagine the desperation? I mean, I need you to understand this part of it. It's not just like we read stories, like, yeah, story, story, story. There is desperation that she's going through. I mean, she's been sick with something that, that in her culture made her unclean. She was unacceptable in her community. She was an outcast. I mean, it's like there's leprosy, and it's the stuff she had, right? I mean, like she was an outcast. Until that stops, we don't want you around us. I mean, there's a sense of significant desperation in her. Now, let me stop for a second. The chapter or that passage begins with a man named Jairus coming. And in front of a large crowd, you got one publicly in front of a large crowd. You got one sneaking up from behind. In front of a large crowd, there's a man who's a religious leader who's falling at the feet of Jesus in desperation saying, 
my little girl's dying. Can you come touch her so she's healed? Now, if you're Jarius, right, and you come to Jesus, fall on your feet, your knees for Jesus, you tell Jesus how bad it is, Jesus says, yes, I will go and see your daughter. There's hope, right? And then on the way to go see the daughter, right, he's interrupted. Now, Jesus was interrupted with Jairus, too. Jesus wasn't there to talk to Jairus. I mean, he didn't think he was anyway, right? I mean, I'll talk about this in a minute. That's, that's a divine, those are called divine appointments. But he, he had this moment with Jesus. And then on the way to meet his, to see about his daughter, I mean, he, he's desperate, right? His daughter is dying. Is, I mean, the way the terminology is in the Greek, it's like almost dead. Like, it's not dying as in like they got three months. It's like, like I'm not sure she's still alive. She's breathing her last breath now. Time, but that's the situation. And so as they're going to that situation, some girl, some woman walks up. She's been bleeding for 12 months, I mean 12 years. Can't she wait for a couple more minutes? We need to get to my daughter, okay? I mean, think about that for a second. There's desperation in the man whose daughter is dying, right? There's desperation in the woman who's been, had a disease or whatever's wrong with her for 12 years, and there's Jesus. Are everybody tracking so far? Okay. Verse 29. Well, it ends with verse 28 saying, if, if I just touched his clothes, I'll be healed. Verse 29. Immediately, so the moment she touched his clothing, immediately the bleeding stopped, and she, felt, uh, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who has touched my clothes? Now, I, I can spend a lot of time chasing rabbits. We, you know, we just don't have time for that kind of stuff. But um, a, part of their, a part of their mythicism at the time was they believed, certain, like, you know, almost like in magic, like a, they believed things like that. They, you know, if, um, if uh, Jesus had set this chair, if you touched the chair, you know what I mean? If Jesus had drank from this cup, if you, if you drank from that cup, if, if they, you know, wore that clothing, if you touched that, it, that was kind of a, a false belief. It's not, that's not real, that's not biblical, that's none of that kind of stuff, right? So in her mind, that, that, Jesus was wanting to address that, but I mean, in her mind, that was kind of the deal. She didn't have to talk to Jesus, she just had to touch him. Now in her world, that was called faith, which I'll explain to you in a second. But Jesus is getting ready to address, because the, the point is, is that he's getting ready to call her out. Like he's, oh, whoa, 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 who just touched me? Now the disciples, let me read it first, I guess. Um, at once Jesus realized the power was gone, verse 30. He turned around in the, crowd asked, in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Verse 31. Do you see the people crying against you? His disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing, um, then the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling in fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Now, crowded around, pressed around, that phrase is not we're in a crowd. It's like that thing where everybody's bumping up against you. You know, it's like you, you know, you're in a large, like a concert environment or a ball game environment or whatever it is, and it's really, you know, a packed out place, and we're all trying to leave down the same narrow hallway. You know, it's like, right? It's that kind of environment you gotta have. And so the disciples are saying, I mean, you're being touched by all kinds of people. But Jesus knew the difference in a touch. It was just accidental touch and the touch of one that was by faith. And he turns to the woman, he finds out who she is, and then he spoke to her. He called her daughter. Now, I may bring this back up at the end of the service if I have time, but the, the point of calling her daughter was that she was the outcast, and he's now saying you're part of the family. You, you see, I mean, he, he was, because he was, see, the reality is that some of us feel like the outcast. We feel like the black sheep. We feel like, you know, we're doing okay today, but we've got a long list of failures behind us in our past. We got, you know, 12 years of being the outcast. And even though we can come to church or even though we can give our life to Christ, sometimes we don't feel like we're family. Sometimes we struggle and we feel like that I really can't be forgiven. Or I know I was forgiven on the cross, but I really can't just forgive myself. I can't just receive grace and receive mercy and pick up as if that never happened because it obviously happened. 
from biblically before Christ, before God, the Bible says that we have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Regardless of your or my past, we don't stand in our good deeds, our righteousness, our willingness to be, our ability to stand before God. We stand in the righteousness of God that he gave us through Christ. So when Jesus says to her daughter, in their culture, that was extraordinary. In their culture, that was, I mean, that one sentence was violating all kinds of religious laws. And that one sentence, to the people in that culture standing around him, that one sentence took her from being the outcast who was shunned to being family. Verse 35. While, she was, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus. Okay, now get the picture. She's desperate. The dad's desperate. The dad's walking with Jesus. You know, we're not walking near fast enough. You know what I'm saying? I mean, can you get the picture? Right, we're not walking near fast enough. And then Jesus is stopping. Because the woman didn't stop him. Jesus is walking, and then he stops. Who touched me? What do you think Jairus is doing? <whistles> or pulling, Right? Or it doesn't even matter who touched you. Let's go. I got stuff. You know, we, we, okay, let's go. Right? I mean, don't picture Jairus as like, you know, he's really cool with everything. Because he's not cool. Wait, okay, wait. The Bible doesn't say he wasn't cool. But he was a dad. Right? Whose daughter is dying. And the cure for the daughter who's dying is standing here having a little talk. Now, I don't know what kind of dad you might be. But I don't know any dads who's gonna be sitting like ain't no big deal. Right? So you picture the emotion, picture the intensity, picture the whatever. Okay? The I don't know, he, he, on the best moment, he doesn't know if we'll make it back in time. Okay? And then his friends walk up. Um your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? I mean, can you imagine that rush of emotion? I mean, maybe if I had ran a little faster to get to Jesus. Maybe if we weren't walking in this stupid crowd, all these dumb people, maybe we could have walked a little faster. If that crazy woman had not messed with him, if he hadn't turned around, right, all those kind of things, right? Overhearing what they said to Jesus, he told him. So Jesus talking to the dad, don't be afraid, just believe. See, the reality is, is that faith is not about our situations or our circumstances. Faith is not about what we see. Faith is required, or biblical faith is when we believe in what we don't see over what we actually do see. That's faith. Now just think now, I mean, let's make this real. Don't, don't, get, don't get all biblical and you know, oh yeah, no big deal, don't do that, because that's not how you'd be, right? But in the moment, and we're not talking about, I mean, think about the things we deal with. Most of us aren't dealing with the daughter who's dying and she's walking that direction, okay? But the things we deal with, but just imagine the intensity of this moment. And then your friends walk up and say, yeah, she's dead. And then Jesus says, have faith. Don't worry about it. Just believe. What do you choose then? Frustration? Anger, disillusionment, sadness. Now the reality is, is that that could be in your situation on any given day. It's, it doesn't look right. It looks like it's going this direction. I know God said, I feel God put in my heart, I have the faith to believe, but that ain't what it looks like. And sometimes the only voice you hear is the Spirit of God whisper to you, just believe. But the storm is raging. And just believe. Now, I mean, just about this chapter. I mean, there'd been a storm that had been stopped. 
There had been a demon-possessed man, possessed by not a demon, but a legion of demons who had been healed, been restored, been, the demons had been cast out and been restored to his right mind. You got a woman who had been sick with something for 12 years who is no longer sick. In our minds, as we think, man, if I was living in that moment right then, I'd have no problem having faith. Yeah, yeah, you would. See, we see God's doing stuff around us all the time. We don't see it. We, we, we see it in the moment, and we, we have a short memory. I talked about a few weeks about having a long memory. Like following Christ requires a long memory. Because what happens is you have to remember what he did because in the moment, it doesn't look that way. In the moment, it's like this is going to fail. In the moment, this is never going to happen. In the moment, this is going to, hey, God has forgotten about me. He's forsaken me. This is, this is a train wreck. This is never going to work out. And sometimes, in the middle of it not working out, in the middle of the train actually wrecking, God's still speaking and saying, just believe. Just trust me. Now, here's the deal. The moment that we stop believing, we forfeit victory. Now, I know some of my theological geek friends will say, oh, no, you can't do that. Read your dadgum Bible. No, no, if God said it, it's going to happen. Then why is there a thing called obedience? If disobedience has no consequences, then why do you even talk about it? Why is there words like surrender and sacrifice? Why does the Bible talk about perseverance? Why is spiritual warfare even mentioned? Why does sometimes it says, just stand still and God will fight for you? See, the point is, is that God asks us to choose to believe or not believe. And why does James say, he who doubts should not expect to receive anything from God? Because he who doubts is double-minded. They're unstable in all their ways, which is offensive to us. But now think about this, Jarius your, dad, your, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher? Yeah. And then Jesus, um, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And Jarius, uh, it's all right, Jesus. She's dead. Thanks for, thanks for the effort, man. Talk to you later. And Jairus went home and planned a funeral, and he would have buried his daughter. Not because Jesus couldn't heal. Because he chose doubt. He chose, to, sometimes doubt isn't I doubt Jesus could do it. Sometimes doubt is I choose to believe in something different. And when his circumstances went from she's dying, Jesus can heal she's dying, but can Jesus heal she's dead? And sometimes it's like Jesus can fix it until the train wreck happens, but then after the train wreck happens, Jesus can't fix it anymore. Jesus can change it until this happens, but then once that happens, Jesus can't change it anymore. That's not a biblical concept. Now, the point is, is that when you get to go about what God speaks to you, what God gives you faith to believe, what God gives you peace to hold on to, right? Because the point is, is that when God speaks it, all we have to do is then cooperate with him. Now, Jesus, he can do it regardless of us. And he does. I can give you lots of examples. Times like I can't, but I can give you a lot of examples where even in the midst of our rebellion, God proves his point and does what he wants to do. But I can also give you countless examples, whether in personal lives or in church life or whatever it is, where God wants to do something, and because of sin, because of rebellion, because of lack of obedience, because of lack of surrender, because of lack of sacrifice, then it doesn't happen. In this case, it could not happen because of doubt or because of placing your faith in a new reality. My reality is she's dying. Jesus can heal her. My new reality is she's dead, and that's too late now. It's just putting your faith, it's not so much he doubted Jesus as he put his faith in a new reality. Everybody tracking with that so far? Stan, you tracking with that? Okay, now, Jesus says, and he's saying it right in front of the people who just said she's dead. Surround by a crowd of people. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Verse 37. He not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John and the other brother of James. Now, that's always curious. Now, most likely, 
most likely. So you have to remember, all the disciples were there and the large crowds pressing around him. Okay? He's on his way someplace. Once the she's dead came in, Jesus, from that point forward, made everyone stay back, including nine of the 12 disciples. He chose three. And those three, and Jesus, and the Father went on their way. Now, was that focus? Was that, I don't need the show around me? Was that, I don't need the doubters and the skeptics around me? I mean, what, why was the reason that he was making a choice? I don't know. I mean, I, I can give you lots of possibilities of an answer. I don't know for sure. It could be that he just didn't trust Peter, Peter James, and John by themselves. I mean, like, you other nine disciples, you guys are fine back here. But if I take Peter, James, and John, if I don't take them with me, they're going to cause all kinds of ruckus. You, know, you remember in grade school back in the old days, I don't know if they do it anymore, but back in the old days, the teacher had to leave the room for a few minutes. And then she would pick the nice kid, the studious one, the one who didn't make any mistakes, you know, the nice kid that wouldn't do anything wrong, to, on the board, to put tallies. Did you guys ever have that? I did when I was growing up, because that's the kind of kid I was. Anyway, and so it'd be like, you know, usually a girl, but a person was standing by the chalkboard and they're watching. And if anybody's talking, she's marking things down, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Well, maybe Jesus had telltales. Jesus, while you were gone, you can't believe what Peter was doing. You know, and I don't know. Maybe Jesus had to take him with him for whatever. But my guess is that he took him with him because that was part of his inner circle, that he was developing them and he was, um, he, he wanted them to witness his power. That's my guess. Okay, I don't know that, but that's my guess. Okay, the Bible doesn't really say for sure. But I can, give you, I can give you several examples in the Bible where he pulled the same three away, where he pulled them away at his ascension, for instance. You know, um, anyway, side point. He pulled them away and he would say, you know, come with me, everybody else stay here. All right. So now Jesus, the father, and the three disciples, five of them are walking through the guy's house. Um, verse 38. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw the commotion, the people crying and wailing loudly. Back in their culture, they actually had professional mourners. Okay? And the noise they typically made was, ah! Okay, so you just picture that, right? Jesus walking in, and you got professionals. I mean, they're not even really mourning. I don't even know the kid, but you're paying me dollars here to do this. Ah! Ah! Right, a lot of them. Makes you suicidal, doesn't it? Just look okay. okay, that's what he walks into. And Jesus says, <laughs> he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? <laughs> the child is not dead but asleep. <clears throat> Verse 40, but they laughed at him. You're not the first person to be laughed at for your faith. And you won't be the last. After he put them all out, so then he turned around and he removed them from the house. He removed the skeptics. He removed those who laughed at him. He took the father, or the child's father, and mother and his three disciples who were with him, and he went where the child was. He took her by the hand. So picture, like a, I picture a bedroom. So picture a side room of some nature. She's on some kind of cot of some nature, right? And she's laying there dead. Walking in is a mom, a dad, who had to be filled with something between hope and grief. I don't know, whatever. You have three disciples just hanging out, see what's going on. You got Jesus. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. I mean, I don't know why God does numbers that way, but it just seems to happen sometimes. The woman who had had the blood issue, had had it for how many years? A little girl died, and she is 12. He heals the walking when no one else can, and then he turned around and healed the little girl. He has power over life and death, is what he's making a point of. 
At this, they were completely astonished. I mean, even in their faith, they were shocked. Like, oh my gosh, it actually worked out. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Now, the last story, the demon-possessed guy, he said, I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, go back to the Decapolis and tell the story of what happened. Right? And then here you are a story later, and he's saying, yeah, don't tell anybody. Again, I don't know why. I don't know why he tells that. Could be he thought, because he knew maybe they would, um, maul, they, would, they would chase after him again. Like he didn't want the, like, I don't want the crowds around me. You know, because he's been chased by the crowds, and now he's away from the crowds. Maybe he's like, let me just kind of skip out of here. Okay? Maybe it was, you know what? They laughed at us. They have no right to hear the story and celebrate now. I don't know what it was, right? But the picture is, is that he's saying to those five people who witnessed what just took place, like a 60 year little girl, don't talk about it. There are times, there are times when God does things in your life, most of the time, he wants you to talk about it. He wants you to tell the story. He wants you to declare his praises of the one who called you out of darkness, of the one who healed you, of the one who restored your whatever he restored or to change whatever he changed. He wants you to talk about the, the transformation of your life. He wants you to talk about what he's done. But, you know, what, what was the difference before I followed Christ and after I followed, all that kind of stuff. He, he wants you to speak of him most of the time. But there are times he don't want you to talk. Sometimes there's things God's doing that if you say it in the wrong circumstance, all it does is stir up the enemy. You know, the people, because it's not the people. Remember, our battle's not with flesh and blood, but powers and principalities, right? Sometimes all it does is stir up the powers and principalities to stir up the people who do all the talking. Sometimes it's just like keeping my quiet. Sometimes the reason we want to talk is we want to brag, like we're so cool. And sometimes not talking is an act of humility. Sometimes it's about proper timing, like there'll be a time and there'll be a place. Sometimes it's because the person is not ready to listen right now. Well, there's a passage, and I didn't look it up, but there's a passage in the, in the Gospels that says that the, to not pour, like it was somebody going and sharing the Gospel, and, and Jesus said, well, what did they, the, the disciples said, well, what did they reject us? And Jesus said, shake these feet off your, the dust off your feet and walk away. Like, okay. In another place he said, don't throw your pearls before the swine. In other words, don't share the Gospel. People don't even hear it. They don't care. They, they're not putting any value in what you're having to say right now. Sometimes it's don't, no reason to talk about what God's doing in that circle or that person, because they, at that moment, they're, they're not giving you any, they're not listening at all, they're placing no value on that. On the other hand, it's about learning to pay attention and look for opportunities when somebody's ready to listen. I was, uh, I don't know if I ever told you guys this story or not, if you've been here a long time, probably, I'm sure in the last 15 years I told it, but one time I was, uh, I was, uh, um, I was playing in a basketball in a gym, and um, there were some friends, not really friends, like some guys went to my church that I was on a basketball team, like a rec league team, you know, a community rec league team. And, um, and I, I know I'm old and fat now, but I used to be actually pretty good at stuff. Anyway, and so, and so they had me be on the team. And so uh, these guys were, um, the ones who went to church weren't very godly, let's just put it that way, all right? I mean, they kind of went to church sometimes, but yeah, you'd have never known that. Anyway, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm leading people to Christ. I'm, I mean, I, I, I can't take, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, get you back in the, in the environment I was in, but, but there's a lot of cool stuff happening and, you know, people getting saved and all this kind of stuff. And, and I was, you know, I, I was in that environment. That's what I was doing all the time. And um, um, these guys need Jesus in the worst way, right? And, um, um they, 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 we had a game, and we made to come play because they were missing some players. Okay, fine, I'll show up. So I show up, and I, they weren't going to let me play. All right, so and I, just like I, was, I am now, I'm way too busy to show up at the end of somebody's bench, you know, one of those kind of deals. But I'm sitting there, just mind my mind, or whatever. Okay. And people would rotate in and out, but I was never going to rotate in and out. It wasn't going to happen. As the game goes on, they're behind, okay? And, um, um, they're behind, and there's foul trouble and that sort of thing, right? And I can't remember the exact scenario of who it was and what the deal was. I can see them, but I can't remember what actually was going on. But, but the guys that I would have kind of went in for either was in foul trouble or didn't want to go back in. They were frustrated because they were down by like 15 points. 
okay? And there's like three minutes left, three and a half minutes actually left to go in the game. They're down by three points. And, um, or two points, I mean, they're down by two points. And um, they're down by 15 points because I'm going to tell you a story. We end up winning by two. Anyway, they're down by 15 points. And then, so it's not my turn to play. So if you've ever been on the end of the bench, when it's time to go in at the end of the game because it's mop-up time, nobody likes that, right? It's like, okay. So I go in, and that's not how I was thinking. I go in, and I'm actually praying. I don't know, you guys, I got all these stories. You, don't, you, know, I don't, you may not believe me, but I'm not lying. I mean, well, you may think I am. I, I go in the game, and I'm praying. Instead of being frustrated, I'm praying. Because my whole time I've been praying, God, give me an opportunity to earn a right to tell him about Jesus. That's all I prayed about, okay? I prayed that prayer. I prayed a lot, to, you know, I thought about a lot. Here I am going in the game, 15 down, three and a half minutes ago. Um, long story short, there was multiple steals involved. There was uh, a lot of three-pointers involved and a couple foul shots. And um, I scored 17 points in three and a half minutes, and we won the game by two. Okay? Now, anybody who knows how that stuff all works, even by accident, you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? You just, it's not something you just do. Okay? I'm fully aware of that. Now, I'm a good player, but I'm fully aware that what just took place was beyond my abilities. You know what I'm saying? Even like, why would you, you know, if I'm getting all these steals, why would you even come my direction? You know what I'm saying? Why wouldn't you, I mean, there's all kinds of issues with that. So then, after the game, well, you can imagine, right? I mean, it's like, wow, Tim's so awesome, okay? I had an opportunity to accept that Tim's so awesome or to use that opportunity to talk to him about Jesus. One, I didn't want them to expect me to do it next week. You know what I'm saying? Because when your shooting average goes from 100% down to like, you know, 30 or whatever it is, it's like, dude, what's up? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm normal this week, and last week I was anointed. You know, <laughs> what do you say? Right? I mean, I, I can tell you these stories forever about stories where I prayed prayers, and then God gave me an opportunity. Now, in my world as an athlete, a lot of those things had to do with things athletically that I could not normally do. At the time, I was running in center field. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. I jumped off a of, field. You ain't going to believe this. You're going to think I'm lying. Okay, I'm running, I'm praying a prayer, I'm in the center field. I'm praying a prayer. I'm like, God, if you could just give me an opportunity. Just, just give me an opportunity. And I was really good, and I read really well, right? I got good jumps, and I got my good jump, and I'm chasing the ball that's going over the fence and left center. There is no way in the world I'm gonna get to it, right? And if I do get to it, it's gonna be over the fence. I don't look, I'm running. So I'm not looking, right? There's a fence, like a chain link fence. I'm running. Somehow, my foot hits the fence. My cleats catch the fence. I jump straight up in the air. My feet are over the top of the fence. I catch the ball, and I come back in bounds. Now you're going, that didn't happen. I make a promise to you, in front of two softball teams and lots of people watching, my wife included, that happened, okay? Now, am I gonna walk back in and say, boy, I'm good? You don't do that after that kind of a deal, right? You walk in when they say, how in the heck that happened? Well, I was in the outfield, and I was praying a prayer that God would give me an opportunity. I just needed to get your attention for a second. What that was, and I tell them about Jesus. Now, you may not be an athlete, you may not be in that world anymore, or you may not be, whatever it is you do, I'm just telling you, if you will pray and ask God to give you opportunities, it may be in any environment, it may be finding solutions. Like, how'd you go with that solution? Well, you can take all the credit for it if you want to, or you can just turn around and say, um, well, I prayed a prayer in the middle of that meeting, and I just asked God to give me some wisdom, and you know, then all of a sudden I had this idea. See, the thing is, is about knowing when it's time to speak and when it's time to be quiet and listen. It's about praying and looking for opportunities. Not just, I'm looking for an opportunity. But actually ask God to give them to you and be prepared to step into them when they happen and be prepared to make a choice against your ego when they happen. Because it's really easy to say, I am good, you're right. I am smart, you're right. 
And sometimes it's hard to say, no. What happened was, I prayed a prayer. God responded. I've got your attention for a couple minutes. You'll lose your attention. It won't last for long. I got your attention for a couple minutes. Let me tell you about Jesus. Number one in the outline. Some interruptions are divine appointments. Some interruptions are divine appointments. Some are routine. They're just interruptions. You know what I mean? Like the train on the way to school, right? You're barely going to make it to work, and then that train shows up, right? And then you get frustrated about the trains in Carlinville, just be grateful you don't live in Litchfield. You know what I mean? Right? I got the longest trains I ever saw in my life. Sometimes, sometimes interruptions are just distractions. It's like you're focused on the thing you're supposed to be focused on, and it's just a distraction. But sometimes those interruptions are divine moments, divine appointments, divine opportunities to stop what you're doing for a second and partner with God in what he's trying to do. Now, every interruption is not that. You know, when the train interrupts you, I call that routine. You know, when you're doing whatever you're doing, sometimes you just have a routine interruption. Don't get caught up in every interruption is God, right? And sometimes they're just distractions, right? But there are times, and if it's, if it's if the interruption's from God, he's gonna let you know, you're gonna know. Like, when Jesus is getting out of the boat and the demon-possessed guy's coming to him, okay, he's got that figured out. When the, Jesus gets out of the boat and then the guy, the, the, the dying daughter comes up to him, he, he, those were easy to see. When the woman touches him, he didn't, he didn't know it was coming, but when she touches him, obviously it's God. And he turns around, not to, make her, not to get her in trouble, he turns around to, to bless her. He turns around to, to release her, not just to release her from her physical thing, but to say emotionally, relationally, your daughter, your family. He, those are all interruptions. But he recognized the difference in the interruption that was just routine or distractions and the interruption that was, that was divinely ordained. Number two in the outline, divine appointments require faith and action. Divine appointments require faith and action. The reason that we miss most of our divine appointments is because we don't have the faith to step into them. And therefore, there's no action. I mean, Jarius, the dad, he had to come from where he was at, leave his dying daughter, and run to Jesus. He had to have faith and then the action of coming and doing it, right? Falling on, it wasn't like, He's around a bunch of people. I ain't talking for much people. Man, I wish he'd get by himself for a second. Because maybe, ready? Maybe the bunch of people around him, ready? Okay. Jairus leaves his daughter. He's running to find Jesus, right? He's a religious leader. They all know who he was, right? He sees Jesus, big crowd of people around him. Maybe that was an interruption for him. And he's sitting back going, I, I can't go talk to him in front of people. That's embarrassing. That distraction, that interruption became a distraction to Jairus, could have cost his daughter's death. Instead, he ran right through that one, falls to the feet of Jesus, and says, my daughter's dying, can you come and heal her? So she can live and have life. He didn't care. The heart of a dad was broken. He did not care about who was watching him. Maybe it's the woman She's sneaking up behind him. She's embarrassed. She's ashamed. She feels gross. She's already an outcast. And she's thinking, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Regardless, it required not just faith, but it required action. Setting in your room Saying you have faith, but not being willing to back it up by your action is not faith at all. I don't know what you want to call it, but it's not faith. Sometimes the action is set still. Sometimes the action isn't aggressive. Sometimes the action is patient. Sometimes the action is just chill out and trust me, I got this. And other times the action is step out and respond. But faith, or but 
divine appointments always require faith and action. You gotta step into it. I mean, even after I score all those points, you don't have to jump off that fence that day, right? I, it's not like you, like on the fence one, because the, the, the basketball court would happen right there in front of everybody. The fence one, I jumped off the fence, caught the ball. I'm running in because you're we're deep in the outfield and you're jogging in. That's how you do that, right? You jog in, hold the ball up, got it, okay, I'm jogging in. And I'm actually thinking to myself, what am I gonna say when I get to the dugout? I had time to think about it. And I wasn't about to let that one go. In the basketball one, they, they it all happened, they're all right here around me, right? I didn't really have time to think about it. I just had to either respond or not respond. You know, it's like, it's like, let me, guys, let me, hang on a second. Let me tell you about this. And I told him, here's what happened. I prayed this prayer. And here's what God did in response. Not because I'm that good, because he wanted to give me an opportunity to earn, earn a moment of your attention to tell you who he is. That's all it was. If I had chosen faith, but then when the moment happened, I didn't have the action to step into it, then the results that occurred wouldn't have taken place either. Number three, has your need been interrupted? Has your need? You're the woman with the issue of blood, whatever yours is. You're the man with the dying daughter, or, you know, whatever your issue is. You're the situation. You got the concern. It's your family. It's your finances. It's your health. It's your emotions. It's your situation. Are you the person that has the situation and it's been interrupted? Let me think about that for a second. Jarius got interrupted. Then he hears his daughter died. Or Jesus got interrupted. And Jarius hears his daughter died. He could have just walked away. How many of us in that moment have just walked away? I thought God was going to, and then it didn't happen, and we just walked away. Now, there's times to walk away. You know when it's time to walk away? When you realize that what you thought was never from God in the first place. Okay, that, that happens. But if God doesn't release you, if God keeps giving you peace, if God keeps giving you faith to believe, not, not faith as in you manufacture faith, you know, I believe, I believe, I believe, but where it's just a supernatural gift of faith. That's what that is, it's a supernatural gift of faith. When God gives you a supernatural gift of faith to believe something, and then gives you the peace in the midst of the storm to trust it, you just don't want go and walk away. I mean, you can, but it's not right. If Jairus would have just walked away, he would have missed what God wanted to do in his daughter. His daughter would have ever many days later, they'd have done all the morning stuff, she'd been buried, put in a tomb type of deal, right? Six months later, she's dead, she's deteriorated, she's dust, whatever. And he'd be frustrated, he'd be disillusioned, he might be angry. Jesus didn't heal my daughter. What's wrong with me that God wouldn't respond to me? Why didn't God fix this in me? Why didn't God change this in me? Why didn't God do whatever it was in me? Sometimes our need is what gets interrupted. And instead of choosing faith, Instead of choosing patience, instead of choosing perseverance, we choose weapons of our flesh. I mean, we may say we're persevering, but what we're doing isn't letting God, we're doing it. We're manufacturing it. We're manipulating it. We're trying to work this around to work that around. We got a piece of paper out. We're trying to make all the deals all work out so somehow it works in our favor. And sometimes God's just saying, you know what? Let it look impossible so I get glory. You, you see that? It's not, it's not Tim can score. I can, I can go out and score eight points in three and a half minutes. No big deal, right? Make a couple three-pointers, get fouled once, make a couple shots. No big deal. But you don't score 17 points in three and a half minutes, and the other team scores zero, and you're, you're the one who made all the steals, and you're the one who makes all the points. That doesn't happen. Right? So God does an impossible thing to the point of him getting glory. Not the thing that Tim could have done in his ability, right? When I tell you a story, I jump off the fence, catch the ball, come back in bounds. Okay, what you're thinking is that can't right, that didn't happen. And that is exactly what God loves to do. Think about our church building. God wants to do the kind of things that can't happen, <laughs> and right in front of your eyes, it happens. Are you tracking? 
That's how God likes to operate. God wants to work in your life that if you'll give him an opportunity, do things through me. Give me opportunities to do things that are impossible. Put me in places where it will fail without you. I need to trust you. I'm going to step through this. I want an opportunity to tell someone about you. Then God will give you opportunities. You have to pay attention to them. Then when it looks like it's all falling apart, you have to choose faith. You have to choose humility. You have to choose trust. When Jesus says, just don't be afraid. Just believe. Then you have to not be afraid and just believe. And wait till Jesus gets there. Sometimes it's not waiting until Jesus gets there. Sometimes the first thing is you gotta be the one who runs to him. Sometimes the reason that your need hasn't been met is you're sitting in a corner somewhere hoping Jesus notices you. And what Jesus wants is you to run and fall at his feet and not worry about who's watching. And not worry about the crowd of people around you. Just run and fall at his feet. Yeah, but people's gonna say something. Yeah. If you're worried about people saying something, you will never be an actual follower of Christ. I mean, you'll be saved. But you can't follow Christ if you're worried about people talking about you. You can't really follow Christ because he's going to go places that make you feel uncomfortable. He's going to go places that going to stretch you out of your comfort zone. He's going to ask you to do something. He'll give you opportunities to do things that you can't ever do. And if he fails, you look like an idiot. I mean, you'll look bad. But if it wins, it works. You don't even look good. You just have an opportunity to talk about your Savior who did something to prove himself to someone. Buildings aren't about buildings. Growth isn't about growth. My life or your life changing isn't about my life or your life changing. Other campuses aren't about other campuses. Those are things that God wants to do to prove himself to people who do not believe in him. The religious and the irreligious together. Just because someone goes to church, nobody believe God. There are some people who attend this church. There are people who attend other churches who are faithful believers. They're going to spend eternity in heaven, and they need to have their faith ignited by a God who can do the impossible. So maybe, just maybe, your need has been interrupted by something, by your doubt, by your fear, by other people gathering around, by time, by whatever it's been interrupted by. Be patient. Have faith. Jesus is on the way. That's it. Be patient. Jesus, come on, let's go. His timing is perfect. It isn't to meet your calendar, I know. It doesn't meet my, my calendar, our church's calendar either. But his timing is perfect. Be patient. Believe, have faith. Because Jesus is never late. If he told you he's coming, he's on his way. What you gotta decide is, is where the need that you need to meet is a need where you need to run to him, throw yourself at his feet, or whether your need is one where you need to wait for him to get to you because he's coming. Let's pray you respond to God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, um, for God, little stories that happened centuries ago. That regardless of the circumstances are filled with truth for today. God, you... Uh, God, you're outstanding. You're magnificent. You're majestic. You speak things into, the, into existence that were not. God, help us be a people who trust you, who believe in you over the circumstances we see, who believe in you over the emotions we feel, 
who believe in you over the thoughts that we have. God, display your glory. God, I ask you to do the things, whether it be financially, whether it be in, in areas of spiritual transformation. God, whatever those things are, whether it be numeric growth or it be spiritual growth, God, whatever they may be, God, I ask you to do the things that only you can do to give us an opportunity to display your glory, to tell the story of your majesty, to God, to talk about who you are and how you love people, how you're forgiven people, how you're not holding their sin against them, but you're restoring them and you're turning their hearts back towards you. God, give us an opportunity to earn the right to tell the story. And God, give us eyes to see that opportunity. So Jesus and I pray, amen.